वेलकम टू न्यूज़ क्लिक पाकिस्तान एंड कश्मीर हैव बिकम एंड कम टू अक्वायर आर बीइंग यूज्ड एज इन अ पेजोरेटिव सेंस एज इलेक्शंस ड्रॉ क्लोज लॉट हैज हैपेंड इन द रीसेंट टाइम सो इट्स इट्स वर्थ आर वाइल टू रीविजिट सम ऑफ द इश्यूज दैट हैव ऑलरेडी बीन डिस्कस्ड बाय मेन मीडिया but today we have with us amarjeet singh dolat who retired as the head of uh, research and analysis wing and uh, then he was posted as advisor uh, to the government of india uh, on jammu and kashmir but very significantly mr dolat served from 1988 to two, uh, to 1990 the two years preceding uh, the start of insurgency so he has Uh, a very close understanding of the situation in jammu and kashmir so we'll be discussing developments both in jammu and kashmir as well as our relations with pakistan with him welcome to news click sir thank you i like to start with pulwama suicide attack one thing that has intrigued us many of us is that while pulwama resulted in india undertaking air incursion and uh, firing missile on balakot so called terror camps the issue that has been missed out or has been underplayed is the the uh, is the issue of suicide bombing which reemerges after a gap of nearly 19 years if a kashmiri's involvement has to be kept in mind and at least 15 16 years since jaish e mohammed uh, more or less uh, became defunct or went into the background after 2003 so how important and how significant is the suicide bombing in jammu and kashmir in light of uh, recent developments you know it's significant um, mostly because of the involvement of one of our own boys and uh, like you pointed out that it's uh, it's been uh, a long time if ever i cannot recall when last a kashmiri kid was involved in uh, in a badami suicide, bag attack in 2000 in suicide uh, b- b- bombing because most of the suicide bombings have been carried out from across uh, by pakistanis so it is significant and uh, it is uh, more significant in uh, in the light of what is happening in south kashmir so you know when when something like this happened uh, in pulwama one is not totally surprised because um, uh, pulwama has been the heart of or the hub of all the that has gone wrong in the last two and a half or three years now so but it it is a terrible tragedy because uh, i think those who carried it out the the jash uh, and uh, this boy himself would perhaps not have thought that it would result in the death of of uh, 40 crpf men so it's it's a uh, horrendous uh, uh, tragedy but um, well, what does it represent do you think in terms of the conditions in jammu and kashmir today what does it tell us about the situation the situation has seen a, a marked uh, deterioration since uh, the summer of 2016 i happened to be there i i i have this kashmir obsession and i visit kashmir uh, almost every summer the hotels were packed uh, not a room available the flights were you know absolutely booked to capacity so it gave you the feeling that everything is, is looking good but talking to K- kashmiris you you one got the sense that under the surface uh, all was not well and something was going to give and then i heard this uh, these murmurs that uh, eid ko ho, ho jaane dijiye and then we will see what what happens but actually it happened before eid because uh, burhan wani got uh, killed and then after that uh, all hell was let loose or oh, as they say the dogs of war were let loose and uh, it's never been the same after that you know and um, 
initially we were trying to contain whatever happened because uh, you know a lot of uh, the rural folk villagers got involved and i remember that the day i was coming down from sirinagar i i read a statement of uh, the army commander general huda who said very honestly that when whole villages come out in support of militancy there is nothing the army can do so he was being very candid and uh, then uh, you know the the response has been quite uh, heavy handed and that has never worked it has never worked in kashmir it has never worked worldwide in trying to uh, you know end an insurgency or to uh, stop an insurgency it has not worked it does not work and so i would say that this whole idea of operation all out and a muscular policy at all has um, has not worked so what is it in the in the situation what is it in kashmir that is missing and which results in young men even thinking in terms of turning themselves into weapon there's a, there's a lot which is missing you know uh, let me give you an example today that if you look at uh, the what we call the political landscape of of kashmir anybody who's somebody with political aspirations is locked up mm. you know and uh, the only people around are the mainstream people and uh, they are also being uh, at times referred to as anti national now if farooq abdullah is anti national if mehbooba is anti national then uh, as mehbooba has said sometimes that uh, there'll be nobody to raise the tricolor in in kashmir you know so i mean we have all together totally just forgotten the kashmiri you know despite all that has happened delhi has never thought of consulting somebody like farooq abdullah he's been chief minister thrice he is a uh, son of the great sheikh he has been a union minister and you don't want to talk to him you don't talk to mehbooba who was your alliance partner till very recently we don't talk at all why why is it that because the, there is obviously delhi feels we don't need to talk delhi has undergone uh, even earlier when there were opportunities Delhi did show some willingness to talk but somehow it was not seriously carried through or it something was lacking which always resulted in this not materializing what is it happening now what is the difference between past and present i mean this government since it took over in 2014 and the previous governments especially since you were there as a advisor to the first nda government which was led by atal bihari vajpayee you know <coughs> when Muf- mufti saab became chief minister 2015 march 1st 2015 i attended his swearing in in jammu and uh, he said that it is the secular dna of india which has encouraged us to join with the bjp and then in the course of time on a couple of occasions he talked about talking to pakistan and he also said that the only way forward in kashmir was the vajpayee way the rest is a waste of time mufti saab is on record having said that and ultimately during uh, prime minister modi's visit to srinagar again mufti saab made this fatal mistake of saying uh, that we need to talk to pakistan and uh, he was badly rebuffed when the prime minister publicly publicly mm. rebuffed that when the prime minister said i don't need to be told what to do with pakistan or what to do in kashmir and that 
must have hurt Mufti Sahib terribly. He died a broken man. Well, t not talking to pro-Indian parties is compounds the problem that we are already facing in Kashmir. Uh, because it rules out the possibility of any talk with, with uh, those who are fighting see, for Azadi. See, if you are if you're watching Kashmir, it's very interesting that, you know, we have rubbed everybody so much the wrong way that now because of the election campaign, both father and son, the Abdullahs, are talking of bringing back the, the Prime Minister and the Sadr -e Riyasat and they're saying it loudly. And uh, yesterday I heard Dr. Farooq Abdullah speaking in Gandharban and he said, Hum autonomy and he's saying it you know, very strongly. And he said, if India and Pakistan don't make peace, then this part of the world is, is in big trouble. I'll come back to this thing about autonomy uh, a little later, but there's I have another, another point he yeah. made, yeah. interesting, which I mean, I'm sure everybody understands it, but nobody has ever mentioned it. He said, "Pulwama mein 40 log mare hamare shahid hue CRPF ke." So, inhone itna halla kiya, ye kuch kiya, jahaz bheje Pakistan aur ye wo, aur Chhattisgarh mein itne marte rahe hain. वहाँ तो मोदी जी ने जाके कोई फूल वूल नहीं। But tell me one thing. I mean, even the pro-Indian parties are very clear that if government of India seeks a political resolution of the of 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 the conflict of the dispute, then the only way forward is by talking to the separatists. They have been one, I mean, all the parties are one on this issue, that you have to talk to the separatists. The question of talking to the separatists under the present dispensation, when they are unwilling to talk even to the mainstream parties or take them seriously, and in fact are going out of the way to uh, undercut them, what chances do we have for any political resolution now? Uh, on Kashmir? It's not a, just a question of, uh, of uh, resolution, you know. It's, it's, I would say, can we move forward? Can we get a move on? And there is no fo a forward movement at all. Because, you know, elections seem to play a big role in everything. Everything is, is politicized. And uh, possibly the, the, the government in power feels that uh, at this point of time, talking would uh, would go against their uh, election interests. But they are raising the stakes, you see, because by raking up the issue of 35, Article 35A, Article 370, cracking down and banning organizations like jamaat e islami and Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, which laid down unilaterally arms in 1994. And Yasin Malik, in fact, came over ground by saying that he's going to sh uh, uh, shun the path of violence and take to non-violent means to, to carry on with this campaign. Now they are cracking down on all elements. I mean, jamaat e islami which is more or less after 1997, declared itself to, to merely remain as a social, uh, socio-economic organization uh, with its social outreach programs and things like that, an ideological work. Now, what is it? that you see, read behind, Government of India's moves to clamp down on all expression and all uh, shades of opinion in Jammu and Kashmir. Where is it going to lead us? 2019 election. But that we would have queried the pitch for any resolution that post is, that? No, not necessarily. You don't think so? Not necessarily. Uh, for instance, uh, right now, you know, uh, Imran has been sending out a lot of messages uh, for peace and there has been no response for, from our side. And uh, you also know that uh, nobody from Government of India attended the Pakistan National Day function here, uh, which has never happened before. But once Modi ji comes back to power, he will talk to Pakistan. 
that is a certainty. But what that's about Kashmir? Given. That's a, that's a given. You know how and when and that we have to wait and see. But he would certainly talk to. How long can you not talk to somebody? How permanent can this kuti be? I'll come to Pakistan because I want to first deal okay, with Kashmir. Okay, okay. Um, coming but, but back to your question. But there's a link here, you know. I, I understand, sir. But uh, let's stick to Kashmir for the time being. Okay. Because we are arresting people right, left and center, cracking down. Media has been controlled. Uh, Media is controlled everywhere, isn't it? Uh, yeah, no, but the extent to which they are being penalized, for instance, withdrawal of advertisements and all, uh, the uh, shutting down of internet at drop of a hat, uh, which sends everybody in a, in a, in a, in a disarray. Uh, nothing seems to be happening except for repression and a See, greater that, in control. That is what control. I said at the, at the outset, that force has never worked. It will not work. You know, you can go back to Kallana's uh, Raj Tarangani or you can read uh, Mahatma Gandhi on Kashmir or you can in a more general way read uh, Rabindranath Tagore. The message is the same. You know, that force never helps. It never works. And let me remind you of, uh, since we are into insurgencies, that as far back as uh, between 1948 and 1950, the, the British had a big problem in Malaya. And that was the time when they went deeply into this whole business of, uh, of uh, insurgency. And a certain uh, Field Marshal Templar and a, and a certain General Harry Briggs wrote the first handbook on how to deal with insurgency. And the core of that handbook is you must win the hearts and minds of the people. And that handbook, sir, is still relevant. It, it may be relevant, but apparently the government of India doesn't think no. too much of it. No, no, no. Because no, no. Let me remind you, no. no. Let's not forget our own army. Actually, <coughs> and the army has done a very good job in Kashmir from time to time. Whenever the, Kashmir has been under pressure, and uh, the army did work on, on winning uh, hearts and minds of, of, of the people. And actually the army has been quite popular in, in Kashmir. It is only now that things have, have gone to such an extreme that uh, alienation uh, you know, has gone through the roof. Yeah, but the real sticking issue, sir, seems to be that under the present dispensation, there is absolutely no uh, willingness to even talk about autonomy, uh, let alone just talk to the separatists. They're not even willing to because they're now talking about so-called integration of Jammu and Kashmir into which has been an old RSS demand for a very long time, from right from 1950 onwards. So this is nothing new that they are demanding, except that they are now in power, and everybody who's in establishment today seems to be on board on this issue of trying to so-called mainstreaming Jammu and Kashmir, which means uh, completely doing away with autonomy. No, in light not, of not, that... Not necessary, not necessary. I, I think, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the word mainstream, because I think that is what government of India has been trying to do ever since 1947. If, if there is clarity on anything, it is on this, that gradually Kashmir needs to be mainstream. And it has been mainstreamed. If you look at what has happened, if you go back to 1947 and 53 and 75 and, and 88 and, and today and uh, 2002 and 2008 and 2014, there has been so much mainstreaming. And actually, as a result of all this, Pakistan was totally out of the equation. We have, post Buranwani, invited the Pakistanis back again. Pakistan has given up on Kashmir. Even today, let me say, there is no great love for Pakistan in Kashmir. You know, when these green flags and black flags and all these flags come out, they come out of frustration, they come out of anger and ultimately out of disgust. You know. It does not mean that a black flag is that they have 
these boys have turned to ISIS or uh, the green flag is for Pakistan. No, it's just frustration. You mentioned that India uh, was aiming, its objective has always been to so-called mainstream Jammu and Kashmir and it's been happening. That's the way I look at it. It's right, been happening. Right. Which means that autonomy after all, after is obviously it's been eroded. And yeah, eroded yeah, to yeah. a point where See, today it's only Article 35A, which uh, is yeah, there. Yeah, there's 35A to, and there's 370 or whatever yeah, is left of 370. Yeah. Now, in light of After that, all, even Sheikh Saab compromised so much in, in 75. So how do you how do you believe that a, when the whole project has been to mainstream, which means to do away with autonomy, how do you ensure that you Kashmiris see, will feel confident in? Remaining see, part nobody, of India nobody, where the autonomy no, has been eroded. No, 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 no. You see, nobody from Delhi has said that we will do away with autonomy or that we, we want to end autonomy. In fact, uh, if you go back to Narasimha Rao and uh, Dr. Farooq was quoting him profusely last evening, that he said, if it is autonomy, within the Indian constitution, then the sky is the limit. You can have sir, may I remind you what Gulzari Nanda, as the acting Ch prime minister said, where he made a statement on the floor of the parliament, which is authoritative, where he made it very clear that we have hollowed out Article 370. Now, in light of all this, where autonomy has been hollowed out, Government of India, especially the present dispensation, shows no willingness to, as you yourself mentioned, even talk to a pro-Indian leader like Farooq Abdullah. Where do you think are the chances for uh, a political resolution, a peaceful political resolution of this conflict? I am an optimist in all this. And that's why I've kept myself abreast of what happens in Kashmir. Otherwise, long ago I would have thrown in the towel, but I still follow Kashmir because it's got into my bloodstream. But uh, I, I don't give up on, on these things, you know. And uh, the thing is that we need to engage with the Kashmiri. And it should be an engagement which should be consistent. And it should be there always, you know. So that if Farooq wants to come and meet the Prime Minister, he should be able to meet the Prime Minister. And when you go into consultation, the Kashmiris should be consulted. And uh, I, I don't see any reason for, you know, things not, not improving. Of course, we have, you know, uh, come to a situation which is, which is pretty, pretty bad. But in Kashmir, things can change, you know, pretty quickly, sometimes overnight. We've seen that happen over and over again. And one thing is for sure that the Kashmiri craves peace, you know. Recently, you would recall when that uh, former Norwegian Prime Minister, Bondevik, came and met the Hurriyat. The message that the, the Mirwai sent back with him to Delhi was that, please tell them, we want peace and we are prepared to sit down and talk. No, now, they what more do you want? No, from the Kashmiri side, there is willingness. But the point is whether an ideologically driven party like BJP, which is today in power and which... I think has, things will change after the elections. That's what you believe. Well, how do you, where do you place Congress manifesto and it's, uh, and it's uh, what it has to say on Kashmir? How do you read that? I, I think it's a... I was talking to somebody from Srinagar a little while ago. I think it's a fantastic uh, manifesto. Uh, for the Kashmiris, because, you know, we keep talking about uh, the Vajpayee way. And if there is one uh, leader who is really revered in Kashmir, it is Vajpayee. Uh, Kashmiris have not forgotten Vajpayee. And uh, this is, I would call it Vajpayee way plus. Because uh, Vajpayee never talked about uh, uh, AFSPA and, uh, and uh, the Disturbed Areas Act and that. So this has, it is Vajpai, and if I might say it, it has a Chidambaram stamp on it, you know, this manifesto. I don't know if he was, a, if he was consulted, but the whole 
Afspa idea, if you, if you recall, when Omar Abdullah pleaded very strongly with the center as chief minister for just partial removal of Afspa from Srinagar and, and a bit of and Badgam, uh, Chidambaram supported him. So you were there in nine, from 1988 to 1990, the two critical years preceding the outbreak of insurgency. Actually, insurgency growth. started in 88. 88. And that winter of 89, 90 was a, was the, was a very, very bad. It just erupted. Very bad winter, yeah. yeah. Now, in light of that and what has happened in the last three decades, where things have, uh, today, they have deteriorated very sharply from what it was around 2012-2013. What possibilities do you see of uh, arresting this development? Because talking is not the only thing. There surely must be some other uh, confidence building measures that have to be taken to build up the confidence of the people about talk. So what? What do you see happening? Like you said, all these people who have been locked up, I, I don't think there's any need to keep so many people locked up. You know? And uh, almost uh, everybody with a separatist inclination has been locked up, with the exception of the Mirwais, who's actually frightened to, to come out of his house, you know. And um, so I, I think these people have to gradually been be released I'm, told, I'm sure the courts will do de uh, developments in jammu have an impact on kashmir because you served as the ib chief joint director yeah, of in course jammu they and have kashmir. both have an impact on each other you know and therefore the rise of uh, hindutva this, does it impact developments in kashmir this thing this this polarization actually began in 2008. If you recall, you know, there was Amarnath, that yeah. Amarnath uh, agitation. And that is when polarization began. And now it has increased many fold uh, with, the, with the alliance. Because the alliance really, actually, it was the only possible alliance that could have uh, materialized out, out of the 2014 election. And uh, Mufti Saab called it joining together of the North and South Pole. But uh, they never got together. Actually, it was a great opportunity for ending that polarization. But uh, on the other hand, it has increased now, that polarization. Tell me one thing, sir, and this is I'm asking And also let me tell you that both parties have lost as a result. The PDP has lost hugely in the valley. Uh, you'll see when elections are held. And uh, the, the BJP also has lost in Jammu. It will find it very difficult to get 25 seats again in Jammu. Tell me one thing, sir. When the mainstream India itself is undergoing uh, a change for the worse, I mean, we are moving and hurtling towards a situation where uh, uh, with vigilantism and... and uh, uh, lynchings and uh, a language of discourse which is uh, which is I mean it's it's unheard of we have never experienced it in the last 70 years of the kind that we are seeing today why would Kashmiris have any faith and any hope and any confidence in mainstream India the Kashmiri you made a, a couple of points well let me say the poor Kashmiri has nowhere to go he talks Pakistan but Pakistan is only at best, or at worst, a fallback position for the Kashmiri. You know. He doesn't want Pakistan. But when, you know, when things get really bad, then he talks of, of Pakistan. And as far as India is concerned, whatever we have seen, which is not some of it, not, not the very best of India, I think India is too big. And it will not carry on like this, whatever. These are aberrations, I think. Because uh, I would go along with what Mufti Saab said, that the, the DNA of India is secular. And it's, it's, it's a pretty strong DNA. So I, I have a lot of faith in, in this country. I think it's a great country. It's the largest democracy. It has been genuinely secular. 
and these are aberrations. This, where do you put, this too will pass. Okay. Where do you put uh, talks with Pakistan and the likelihood of any opening with Pakistan? Pakistan we have to talk with. Uh, you have stated uh, you have maintained that position <laughs> for a very long time. You see, I, I go back to, to Prime Minister Vajpayee. I had the privilege of watching the great man closely for five and a half years, two years in the RNAW and three and a half in his office. And he was convinced on two things. He, he was a man of very few words, but some things were quite clear. And one was that this permanent confrontation with Pakistan has to end. You know, that's why he took the bus to Lahore. And he said in Lahore, ke hum jang na hone denge. he and, and uh, uh, Mia Saab, uh, Nawaz Sharif. So that, these were his core beliefs. And as far as Kashmir went, likewise, he felt that we need to move forward in Kashmir. The status quo is not, not good enough. Dr. Manmohan Singh also had sir, spoken now on the Dr. floor of Manmohan Parliament Singh saying that war is not an option with Pakistan. Absolutely. Dr. Manmohan Singh actually carried forward uh, the Vajpayee agenda. And that is why, uh, while limiting office, he says that they were only a signature away from reaching an agreement. Now, if that agreement had been reached, I feel may be wrong, but I feel we might have had 15 years of peace in Kashmir. But we need to talk to Pakistan, that you're sure. Absolutely. No matter how, there is no you also way. call it the fact, the, 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 the uh, how can you the not factory talk? of terrorism. Of course it is the factory of terrorism. It is. And we have also borne the brunt of it. But then, he, Pakistan is also a neighbor and an important neighbor. Recently, not long ago, you know Sudhinder uh, Kulkarni, he made a remark that if we were to patch up with Pakistan, then we don't have to bother about China. I would, it's a significant remark. I wouldn't entirely agree with him because China also, you know, is a very important, a much larger neighbor. And we should try and be at peace with, with both. But I think it's much easier making peace with Pakistan than it is with China. I'm not a diplomat. Do you think the developments in Afghanistan and US pull out from Afghanistan and emergence, re-emergence of Taliban uh, will have an impact on uh, India, particularly Kashmir, and our relations with Pakistan? It has um, um, a, um, a marginal impact on, on Kashmir. I would say only marginal. But uh, as far as Afghanistan goes, I think we lost the plot a long time ago, you know. And that is why we, we are now... You mean by not talking to Taliban? Yeah, not talking to the Taliban. You know, we've had so many opportunities and, and the signals from Taliban have even been to the extent that we prefer doing business with you than with Pakistan. But uh, I, I don't know. It seems nobody picked up those signals. And, uh, at least they're not very apparent now. And uh, that is why Pakistan calls the shots in Afghanistan. Um, and that is why the Americans, uh, you know, can't get too funny with Pakistan, whatever they might say, but they need Pakistan. Uh, we we'll end on this note. Uh, uh, if you keep watching News Click and if you have any feedback, any comment, do let us know and write to us. Once again, uh, thank you for watching News Click.